This is a one-off. I'm not going to, at least at this point, do a series on this book. Instead, this is something a little bit different. I want to recommend this book by Wendy Brown, um, entitled Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution. I read it, and I was blown away by it. It was first published in 2015, uh, but I ran across it uh, looking around for other books on the topic of neoliberalism and came upon it. It's in its fourth printing. Um, the last printing was 2017. And for a book that's sort of got one foot in the scholarly world and, another, and the other foot in the, you know, regular readership world, um, it's published by Zone Books, the Near Future series. Um, it's doing really well, and that's because Wendy Brown is a scholarly badass. She knows how to write, she knows how to argue, and if you've been wondering what neoliberalism really is and uh, the implications of it, this is the book that you should read. The picture on the cover of this book um, is indicative of the subject. It does quite well at, at expressing it. It's an abandoned classroom where the ceiling paint is falling off, there's graffiti plastered all over the place, it's dirty, it's dusty, junk and students' papers are uh, all over the floor. It's obviously been abandoned and isn't in use anymore. Now, this book isn't about the state of university public education, but it touches on that as an example of a much, much larger phenomenon of neoliberalism. And it, it worked for me because I am a product of a university education and I'm in the university system. And so I could see a lot of the things that Brown talked about in that chapter, but it's just one part of a book that it is just brings so much together. Many of the things that, um, that I've explored in other ways uh, on this channel um, for instance, dealing with uh, Chris Hedges' book, The Death of the Liberal Class. I did a series on that, um, that book, because it was so great. Um, and Jacques Ellul's The Technological Society. I don't think that Wendy Brown quotes Ellul, but I'll say this, that um, in his own way, Jacques Ellul was, was understanding and writing about the same thing or something very similar. Um, only, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't quite see the full and bigger picture because of the point in time in which he was writing. So Brown comes along at a time when you can see uh, what she calls neoliberalism full-blown. This book also uh, shares kinship with Sheldon Wolin's uh, views on inverted totalitarianism and his book Democracy Incorporated. And um, Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine. I didn't... I haven't really talked much about Klein or that book, but, um, but Brown um, is inspired in a particular section, in particular by um, Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. I mean, the list could go on and on. I've done a series on Charles Taylor's A Secular Age, um, and part of what Klein talks about is, is similar to what Taylor um, is writing about when he uses terms such as disenchantment, disembedding. He describes a sort of alienation and vulnerability in modern, in modern society. Really an evolutionary way, a new way in which people think. Also, there's some kinship with Hans Morgenthau's critique of scientific man. Anyway, um, I could go on and on about this, but the cool thing about Wendy Brown's book is that she, she has this amazing vantage point and this ability to put uh, a lot together and to fairly clearly explain um, these ideas, even though um, they're inspired by such uh, philosophers as, well, Michel Foucault, um, who frankly, whose work I avoided for almost my entire life, but it seems that lately I'm not able to. Well, if this means anything to you, um, Wendy Brown makes Foucault understandable and relevant. I'm not going to dwell on her bio, just suffice it to say that she's a professor of political philosophy from Princeton University, and she's the author of multiple books, and you can find lectures on this particular topic, um, which I will link um, 
in the description of this video in case you want to try one of her lectures. So to just give you some idea of what she's talking about, um, it's about this neoliberalism, which I would identify as a full-blown ideology. If you've been listening to the channel a bit, you already know what classical liberalism is, but I'll just um, describe that a bit. Classical liberalism is the type of thinking of um, a philosopher like John Locke. It's the type of thinking that was involved in the uh, American founding and undergirds the American Constitution as it was originally um, intended by the founders. It has kinship with neoliberalism. It's out of a certain rendition of classical liberalism that neoliberalism emerges, but it didn't, but neoliberalism is not the inevitable outcome of classical liberalism. Classical liberal philosophers tended to understand the limits of the market, for instance, and did not wish to penetrate every sphere of life with market mentality or market thinking. You know, it would have been kind of unthinkable for them, for instance, to think of dating and marriage in terms of some sort of marketplace. But that's where it is right now, right? They wouldn't have seen religious life as uh, anything for the market to become, to um, invade. Much of our cultural artifacts would not be um, penetrated by market mentality either in their view. In other words, um, it, it was where we did our commerce, our buying and selling, and there was a legitimate place for government um, in the view of thinkers like Locke for the public to assert its own wishes in these many other areas and even to a certain extent on the economy. Um, this was the democratic part of liberalism. Okay, so, you know, the people as sovereign um, elected their representatives and would have their say through majority rule over many aspects of life. Uh, what government should completely stay out of, what could be regulated, what could be encouraged and discouraged, and um, even in the area of the economy, uh, what could legitimately be regulated how much should it be taxed, and all the rules of, of trade and contracts, and on and on. So neoliberalism is not the same as classical liberalism. It's almost like, um, I mean, to, to wax a little poetic here or get creative, it's almost like classical liberalism has formed a cancer and it's metastasized, and it's metastasized throughout the body politic. Um, and it is not the healthy tissue that once existed. Neoliberalism is not the same then as free market capitalism. In fact, one of the most effective things that Brown does in this book is talk about the way that government, while in a, like in America in particular, government while preaching um, small small government, you know, reducing government expenditures, privatizing, getting out of um, areas and becoming leaner and meaner, or at least leaner and more efficient. Well, government has actually grown. I mean, look around, take a look. Has your taxes actually gone down? I mean, if you're not, um, oh, I don't know, if you don't own a company anyway, and a fairly big one, have your taxes gone down? Mine certainly haven't. I've heard for decades about how taxes are being reduced, um, both from Republicans and Democrats. Ironically, as time went by, there was less and less light between those two parties. But one thing that they they talk about is, you know, how they're going to free up more of your money for you to use. But somehow, that just doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because while government is getting leaner and more efficient, or just backing out of certain areas. Um, that it used to dwell in, it's pouring that money into other areas that it wants to support. And one of the more genius things that Brown shows is this incredible nexus that has developed between big government and big corporate interests. So the government does many, many things to support the growth of corporate property. Um, and seems to not give a hoot in any practical sense of mid-level and small businesses. So um, we get 
a good deal of talk about free enterprise and entrepreneurialism and so on and so forth, but if we take a good un, um, unveiled look at what actually occurs, small businesses being driven under and uh, going, going away and being gobbled up by large corporate business. Um, for instance, I mean, to make this concrete, where's your rural grocery store? It's gone. Dollar General has taken over. Anybody in the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about. Now that can't happen unless government, big government actually allows it to happen. And I think, you know, Wendy Brown is asking the question, would the majority have actually concluded that that was good and worthy of support? Or how did that happen? How did that happen? Because it decimates rural communities. They, they literally are drying up and blowing away. Small farms, almost a thing of the past. The small diversified farm that used to be the backbone of rural Midwestern communities, it's gone. Uh, corporate farming is taking over. Again, um, the point is, Government is involved one way or the other in these things, in these changes. It can encourage or discourage this type of thing. Just to dwell on the farming thing a bit, one of the surprising areas where you see this nexus between big government and big corporate power is at universities, where companies, huge international conglomerates, uh, spend freely to create whole programs and professorships uh, to promote agribusness and uh, monoculture mono, uh, farming, that all that um, companies like Monsanto and Cargill um, can profit from. They pay for the programs, or a great deal of them. They hire the students that are created by them. But where is the education for people who want to actually become farmers? It's hard to find. You can find it, but you find it in these kind of like boutique programs on the East and West Coast for people who want to go into organic farming. But there's less and less support um, that comes from the universities uh, for actual farming in that older sense. The money for those programs comes from uh, the corporations that, uh, that contribute and also from federal and state government and, you know, the, the, the departments that they support and the programs that they support. There's a lot of tax dollars that go in there too. Anyway, I won't belabor that further, but Brown is making the case that our democracy is being undermined all over the place. Neoliberalism is much more than an economic system. In fact, the advent of neoliberalism ushers in the eclipse of capitalism in favor of a nexus between governments and corporations, a situation in which ironically government stays big and intrusive in the economy while promoting an ideology of small government at the same time. And the governments privatize their services for which they've been responsible and enable competition in a way that inevitably favors those enterprises with the most financial clout. But Brown's most important contribution is her use of Foucault, who she thinks was fascinated with the way in which the mentality of the market was beginning to pervade every area of life. Economics, of course, but also politics, religion, arts and entertainment, and as I've mentioned before, education. Foucault was very critical of the Marxist line that we could understand these things as emanations or superstructure from the economic base, the technology and class configurations at the bottom of, every, of any given era. Foucault, rightly in Brown's view, saw things differently. It was the way people thought that shaped the economy and all else. Foucault showed how the market mentality being pushed by a certain understanding of capitalism that is the libertarian type in my view, was infiltrating other spheres. How do we know if our church or synagogue is a success? We count the number of attendees and the amount of contributions. How do we know if our university is a success? We can count how many students we have, their rate of post-graduation employment, and their starting salaries. How do we know our scholarship is successful? We can count 
are impact factors based on journal rankings and citations. Brown shows how correct Foucault was about the market mentality, but Brown says Foucault was neutral at the very least towards these developments and Brown is aggressively critical. What Wendy Brown adds to all this is an analysis of what these neoliberal developments have done to democracy. In America, students are deprived of a liberal education and made into worker bees in corporate sponsored academic programs. Well, in the Reagan and Thatcher years, which some of you may recall, people were promised that the average citizen would be empowered. What was holding them down was government, its leftist ideology, regulations, and costs. And that while there's some truth to the fact that big government had not managed to solve the poverty problems and other problems, what Brown is realizing is that small government and free enterprise has not materialized as promised and has not therefore solved the problem of poverty and many other problems such as pollution. At the same time, it has seriously harmed the environment and made the majority less free economically, politically, and arguably even spiritually. We're now living in a world in which corporate control has come to dominate the agenda, much as Reagan and Thatcher feared big government had done. To put it in a way that Brown doesn't, what we're dealing with here is an ideology of neoliberalism. We're dealing with what Professor Jordan Peterson, the Canadian scholar and public intellectual, calls ideological possession. He takes his cue from the psychologist Carl Jung. Brown's book makes us wonder, why is this way of thinking so attractive that it has taken over not only conservatives but also liberals? Why has it indeed become almost impossible to argue against it without sounding like a radical? It's because a lot of us have become ideologically possessed. Wendy Brown's book will make you wake up and see the world in a different way, and it's for that reason that I'm recommending it. For myself, I want to take up Carl Jung next. Um, I mentioned Jordan Peterson. He, um, some of you probably listen to the stuff that he does. Um, he is a Jungian scholar. I know quite a bit about Jung's political thought. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I'm a political theorist, but I've studied up a lot on Carl Jung's uh, political thought. And I know what he means by ideological possession, and I think that's right on here. Um, this neoliberal ideology has become extremely entrenched, and it has become a kind of faith, a sort of false faith, a faith that we can deal with everything and every aspect of life um, in, in this mode. And so with that, I will just say again, I highly recommend this book. I'll put a link to where you can get it on Amazon um, in the notes below as well. All right. Thanks. Bye.